Um, Anthony Newman, Global Brand Director of Merlin Entertainment. So Anthony spent the last decade as a trailblazer in the charity sector. And he recognized that powerful brands are built on experiences. Uh, his brand platforms, like Race for Life, resulted in cancer research um, building to over a million um, regular donors. And you know how hard it is to get to those numbers in that sector. And then in 2017, he joined Merlin Entertainment, the world's second largest destination entertainment business. Um, and the number one here in Europe. 62 million visitors a year. And I'm sure we've all enjoyed the smiles and screams of Legoland, Alton Towers, London Eye, just to name a few. Um, but today, Anthony's going to give us a real treat. He's going to give us the inside track on the risks and challenges of building out the world's first whale sanctuary. And the story of how Little Grey and Little White have enriched his brand and how he's overcome many detractors. So I, I really think we're in for a treat. Uh, please join me in welcoming Anthony. Thank you very much. That was very nice. <laughs> Um, yes, so um, I think this is built as a masterclass. I don't think anyone can do a masterclass in building a whale sanctuary because no one's done it yet. So, and we haven't done it yet. We're, we're in the middle of it, actually. So this is, and it's not the sea life story, it's a sea life story. So sea life has many, many stories. And even within the world of um, ethical marketing, ethics, etc. It has many, many stories. This is just one of our ethics stories, if you like. Um, and it's, I made it a little bit interactive, but it's not too audience participation, so don't worry. But it's really cold in here, isn't it? So um, maybe that'll help. And there aren't lo there's not loads of detail on these little screens either. Um, so that's me. So Merlin Entertainment's <laughs> already been introduced, but it is um, a whole bunch of global brands. So it's a British company, which is pretty rare these days, isn't it? But it's global, so it has a whole bunch of global brands. And it has a whole bunch of resort theme parks as well, which are individual attractions. Um, so lots of these ones in that top half um, have got many, many attractions across the world. So um, there's like 20 Madame Tussauds around the world, for example, whereas I think English people tend to think it's just London, or maybe just London and Paris. Um, 67 million guests, so a bit more um, since, uh, since June, so, and um, 1.6 billion revenue. So it's, it's, it's quite a, um, big, and as I said, it's um, second to um, Disney in terms of location-based entertainment. Um, but they are a lot bigger, <laughs> to be honest, so we're, we're a far second rather than a close second. And then one of those brands, which is not on the previous slides, is Sea Life, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it's got a lot of sites around the world. So if you, uh, in the UK, you might know the Birmingham National Sea Life Centre or the London Aquarium, but there's um, actually about 50 across the world. Doesn't eat, oh, this is a funny old slide. Things have gone a bit wonky on these slides. Um, so we've got, we've got a lot around the world and we've been growing in Asia most recently. You won't be surprised. So a lot of our new openings have been in China. So we call ourselves the world's largest aquarium brand, and that's, that is true by a long shot as well. There's very, very few chains, and there's certainly um, no other global chain of aquariums. So that means that we leave a lot. Um, so uh, 20 million visitors a year, um, about 160,000 marine animals that we've got in our care, and the largest community of marine experts in the world. So, if you were doing a marine biology degree, um, you're more likely to end up at sea life than you are just about anywhere else, really. Um, uh, so, and that's something that we're very proud of. You know, it's not, um, it's not a business that um, is just bringing in kind of like untrained people and giving them a few facts. It's actually very sort of based in the science of looking after these very specialist creatures. And this is kind of what it's looked like over time. So we grew very fast a few years ago, then it's really flattened off. And then you can see that what we're hoping to do is whilst these bars are volume, the blue line is revenue, we're expecting to get more revenue out of each customer um, going forwards. And that's really what our strategy now is about. It's about increasing value rather than increasing volume. Um, yes, yeah, so these are very stretched slides. So, 
This is what our brand is about. And that might sound massively obvious to you. Well, it's an attraction, so of course it's about fun and entertainment. Actually, when I joined the organization like a year and a half ago, this wasn't at all obvious for Sea Life internally. Um, so it was thought to be all sorts of different things to different people. And massively, the context in this environment is that many, many aquariums and zoos, etc., are actually not for profits. So they put themselves, they, the way they portray themselves is very, very different. But when you look at the um, consumer insight information, this is why people come to us. And in fact, this is why people go to pretty much any zoo or aquarium. Um, it's for the fun and entertainment. But it is more complex than that. So um, we have, on, as well as that, education, welfare, and, cons and animal welfare, sorry, and conservation as what we call the three pillars. So this is all holding up the fun and entertainment, and it's really, really important to us. If this was any other Merlin brand, it would just be the fun and entertainment bit, really. So dealing with sea life as a consumer-facing, revenue-driving commercial proposition is actually a really complex place where you have all of these different balances to make. As soon as you've got animals in your care, you have a huge responsibility to those creatures. So, a little bit of interactivity. Bearing in mind that very, very brief intro into um, what is pretty big business, what would you expect the reputational risks for Sea life to be? I think the sea world. I think the sea world are confusing with sea world. Yes, yeah, brand differentiation with sea world, yeah, yeah. very important, uh, very true. Significant reputational risk. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Any others? Hi. Are they would actually have seen possible this sort of negative publicity about different sea world centres where the orcas are treated poorly and whatnot? Yeah. So being a bit, well, negatively cross pollinated with that message and you getting um, fairly unfairly, um, let's say, getting negative publicity because of that. Yeah, be, being tarred with other people's brush, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Captivity in general. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So all of that stuff, really. Um, it's, 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 it's high risk stuff, actually, keeping 160,000 animals in captivity. Why have you got them? How do you treat them? Why are some of them dying? You know, well, animals do die. If you kept 160,000 of anything in, you know, anywhere, um, some of them would die. Um, so you have all of that stuff to work, with, work through. Um, the overall picture, so this isn't about, this isn't data about sea life, it's American data. Um, and it's about um, uh, aquarium favorability. So um, the total, fair, total favorable of the population towards aquariums is high, started high. Um, I can't even remember what the dates are on this, but this goes up to about 2018. Um, you can see it's high, but it's also slowly dropping. Now, um, slowly dropping is not a great thing. Um, but it's not a bad thing either, slowly dropping. It's like steady state, it's all very predictable. We can kind of say, yeah, we're in an okay, okay position here. <laughs> but then you've got things like this going on. So the world of steady state changes in attitudes is no longer really the case. So you can see here a really sudden shift to questions like, should marijuana be legalized? Um, and same-sex marriage sudden shifts and you can see here that top line this brown line is millennials and these others are different generations so different segments of the population suddenly changing very rapidly um, and then get a bit more into stuff that's more related to us so is animal research necessary for, for um, medical advancement quite a sharp drop off there that's not a zero based graph pet hate of mine but um, you can see that that that's suddenly quite a shift. So in 2013, you'd think everything was great. By 2016, it's like, oh, there's a problem here. And then SeaWorld's been mentioned a couple of times already. Um, the sinking of SeaWorld. So this is exactly how Sea Life got SeaWorld got caught out. So they probably in a situation where they thought it's steady state scenario. Yes, there's decreasing favorability to us, but it's slow. Everything's fine. Um, we can we can justify what we're doing. Um, we can we can work our way through this. And then a documentary came out. 
and that documentary was exploded by social media, which is a very, very different world now to how it would have been a few years ago, and suddenly their um, share price is dropping off a cliff and their business starts going into loss, and they didn't respond to that quick enough. They didn't see it coming. They were, you know, they carried on. So um, that's a picture of SeaWorld, and this is exactly what we don't do in sea life. Um, so we're not carrying the same kind of risks as these guys. And to just remind you that that is what our brand is about. Um, we actually have the best animal welfare policies. Our practices are second to none, so I wouldn't say we always 100% get everything right compared to our policies, but we're pretty much there and we're certainly as good as anybody else. We have some really excellent conservation projects. And actually, our whole brand is about education. So all of our brand is about, if you take, change the word from education to learning, all of our brand is about education. So that's all great stuff, right? So what have we got to worry about? Well, actually, because nobody cares. Nobody knows and nobody cares. So we've got low brand awareness, low brand differentiation, that, that point about um, SeaWorld, and really, really low awareness of our credentials. And the perception of animal welfare is so much more important, of course, to the consumer than the, the science of it, the actualities of it. If somebody sees a creature in a tank or a cage and they believe that tank or cage is too small, it doesn't matter which scientist says to them, no, actually, that size is fine for that animal. That's not what they, that's not what they believe. That's not what they think. Um, and if the press is full of stories about animal welfare, animal welfare problems, whether it's circuses or zoos or sea world or, or ourselves, then that is then a major problem. You've got a big, um, you've got a big uh, perception problem regardless of the reality. So internally we think we're in a good place. Externally we know that we're not in a particularly good place, but we can kind of um, be happy with ourselves. And then, in 2012, we acquired an Australian leisure group, um, which was a big acquisition of um, quite a lot of different attractions, including things like ski fields in Australia, etc. And it included um, an attraction called um, Shangfeng Ocean World, which is in Shanghai. And that had a beluga whale show in it. Now, Merlin had never kept cetaceans, so um, dolphins and whales in captivity. And in fact, when Merlin had um, acquired an attraction with those things, it shut that part of it down. So Brighton had a, a dolphinarium, for example. It shut that dolphinarium down. It um, actually released those um, dolphins um, into a sanctuary, all great, etc. But now we've got this, now we've got this real problem. So we've acquired this attraction. It's got these belugas in it. We don't agree with keeping um, whales in captivity. It's really, really bad for them. But they're 40% of the business of that attraction, and this is a big attraction. So Shangfeng Ocean World is a, is a big deal to the estate. So if you're in that situation, what would you do? Live your brand. Sorry? Live your brand. OK, so which means? Find a solution to remove them and fill it with something else. Yeah. And what solutions would people come up with? Penguins. Sorry? <laughs> so penguins isn't a solution, it's just a different creature. <laughs> so you've still got, like, I can, put, I, can, I can put penguins in that pool, but what am I doing with the belugas? Well, they go to a sanctuary. So go to a sanctuary is an answer. Any other answers? Assuming you can't release them. Yeah, so maybe, maybe you can, yeah, maybe you can release them, maybe you can't. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, all, you're all thinking this stuff already. So we can't carry on as usual because we wouldn't be living our brand. We wouldn't be leaving our policies as individuals, as human beings in this organisation. We're absolutely against keeping cetaceans in captivity. We can't keep them without doing the show. So one of the answers might be, well, just leave those belugas in the tank, but stop showing them. So they're still in captivity, but at least they're not going through the show. And at least that isn't sort of damaging our brand in terms of what we, what we believe in. Actually, economically, that 
just isn't viable is a key thing. So for us to be able, to, for us to like run that would be incredibly expensive and we wouldn't be able to do anything else with that space, etc. So you know, ethically possible, but just not really a real option. And in fact, it's, it's still not doing anything good for them because they're still in captivity and that's not great for them either. Um, we can't give them to another attraction, especially in China, because it gets it off our plate, but it's still a problem for those creatures. And in China, um, animal welfare uh, policies from the government, etc., are, we would call them non-existent. And we can't release them into the wild. Uh, they, they've, been, they've been in captivity since they were very young, so um, they, just, they just wouldn't survive. That wouldn't be ethical at all. Um, and put them in a sanctuary. There are no whale sanctuaries. It's never been done. So the only answer was build a sanctuary. And that sounds possibly quite easy um, and quite straightforward, and like conceptually it is, but actually it's incredibly difficult to do. How, how are you going to do that? Where is it going to be, etc. Um, <laughs> so the hunt went on for a possible location for a sanctuary, and this went on and on for a long time. And the reason for that is this is fraught with difficulties, this situation. Um, it was going to be in Scotland at one point. Um, you know, so you've got to have the conditions right for these particular creatures. So it can't be somewhere warm. It's got to be somewhere cold. Um, the country has got to accept that. You've got to physically have the right space. On and on it went until eventually somebody said, and it's sort of hard to understand why somebody didn't say it earlier. They said, hang on a minute. There was that place in Iceland where the whale from the Free Willy film went to before it was actually then released into the wild. It's like, OK, let's have a look at that space then. Um, perhaps somebody should have thought of that a bit earlier. Um, and so that is where we are building the sanctuary. So a tiny island off of Iceland. You all know roughly where Iceland is. Um, uh, in, in a bay there. That is all sounding quite straightforward at that point, isn't it? But um, it's not so. What do you think maybe the hurdles would be to this situation? Sorry? Depth of water, yeah. So this has already had an orca in it, so we know it's big enough. It could change. Could change, yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. Anything more? How do you move a sea creature from one area Hello. to another? Hello. Um, yeah, yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah, transport. Big deal. Um, anyone, anyone got roughly a, an idea about how far Shanghai is from Iceland? On the side of the world, literally. It's, it's about, it's about 6,000 miles. Um, the quickest you can fly it is about 17 hours. Generally, it takes 20 to 40 hours. It takes stopovers. And the whales don't live in the airport, right? So you've got to get them to the airport, and you've got to get them from the airport and stuff. Yeah. Anything else? Is the sanctuary meant to be revenue generating? So if you're a No. Very good question, and the answer is no. So this is not going to be an attraction. And that's something that Merlin would pay for. So funding, big problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, did you make money out of them in terms of a hurdle whilst they were still at the previous location? Uh, uh, yeah, good question, and a, and a real ethical one, actually. So yes, we did carry on the show. We dramatically reduced the performing elements of it, which damaged the business considerably. Mm -hmm. But so it was, a, it was enough to keep it going whilst we were in this kind of limbo situation of trying to find a proper solution, but still, still open to criticism. Um, I mean, actually, for the health of the animals, better for them to be doing that, doing something than doing nothing, in fact. But yeah, um, partly damaged the business, but also partly kept it going. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Is it captive, this water, um, or can, could they escape? Yeah, so is, so is, so is it actually suitable for, keep for a sanctuary, I suppose, yeah, is, is, a, is a critical question, yeah. So the first thing is, a sanctuary has never actually, I've sort of said it has been done before, but it's never really successfully been done before because with the orca from the um, Free, Willy, Free Willy film, it was only ever going to be a short-term solution. That was all it was ever designed for. So this is actually really is the world's first whale sanctuary. Um, that's a big deal, means that there's no capability in the world for doing this. We've got to create the capability. 
um, transport of the whales, as has been mentioned. Um, can they survive that journey? In a way, maybe nobody knows yet. Um, can they survive in the ocean? So this is now, a, this, you know, they have been in captivity since they were babies, pretty much. Um, they're now going to be going into, it's not actually the ocean, it's an open water sanctuary, so they will still be in a safe place, but can they actually survive in that? Here's a funny one. When you start putting creatures from another country that have been in captivity into the, effectively into the world, into the open water, they can, they can potentially bring something in that would devastate that environment. They could bring in a disease. Um, export and import licenses. You've actually got to get China to agree to let them out, and you've got to get Iceland to agree to let them in. Um, and detractors. So, there's a whole load of people. There's about 300 and something beluga whales in captivity at the moment. All those people that have got, all those attractions that have got those belugas in captivity, plus the orcas and the dolphins and everything else, don't want this to work. Right? Because it's not going to do their business any good. If you can show, so what they can kind of at the moment say, there's no alternative, we've got to carry it on. If we can show that this works, then they haven't, they haven't got that anymore. Um, and, and then you've called, so you've got a whole load of um, animal welfare people and environmentalists, etc., cetera, um, who just automatically go, oh, well, it's Merlin Entertainments, actually, that you know, we don't believe this. There's a very high level of cynicism over it. Um, and then you're trying to build something in Arctic conditions. Hi. Just a quick question. If it does work, you've got to make sure that, that space you're building is viable to like, literally then get all the other animals that are going to be uh, It's a really good question. It's a really good question. So um, having one or two is not really a sanctuary. It's never, going, it's never going to be big enough. We can't possibly take on being big enough to take all of them. But we are hoping that others will come into it over time. But it's, yeah, it's not designed to be the answer for everything, and it can only take belugas as well. You can't mix species. Um, so it's going to look um, something like this. So it's kind of a C net, really. Sounds really straightforward. Just put a net across. It's massively not, especially when you're trying to build it in Iceland. And actually, you have to have what we call dry side facilities as well. So you have to have a whole area outside of the sanctuary that you can take the whales out of the sea and put them into if they, if they need care for some reason. And then you've got to have ways of getting those whales out of the sea and into that bit, etc. So this is, this is a massive deal. Um, and the, but the answer was, we're going to do it. It's our only answer, we're going to do it. No matter what the cost, roughly. <laughs> People say things like that, don't they? And then they find out what the cost is and then they change their minds. Um, but it's like, you know, we're, we're committed to this and, uh, and we were committed to it before we worked out what the costs were. Um, but because of that, right, so branded better make the most of it. So we're going to have to use this to lever our credibility effectively, lever our, our, um, our ambitions and our ability in, in this area. Um, but you can't have any brand, brand expenditure to do that. So um, because we're already costing, spending millions of pounds building the thing, we haven't got any money left to actually then go and tell people about it. So you better find some ways of telling people about it that doesn't cost us anything. Is there any cost estimate? Uh, there is. I can't tell you the number, but it's millions. So. Merlin is not an organisation that has a lot of money floating around it. It might bring in £1.6 billion a year, but it spends very little money unless it really, really has to. So spending millions on this is just extraordinarily exceptional. And in fact, one of the, one of the um, risks that I didn't put on that list is uh, shareholder expectation, shareholder um, criticism. So hang on a minute, why are you giving my money away <laughs> into this? This isn't something I signed up to. So we had to kind of come up with some ways of doing it. So one of the things we did was um, uh, got on board with an expertise partner, Whale and Dolphin Conservation. Um, that not just gave us the experts some extra expertise, but also gave us a lot of credibility, helped fend off a lot of those detractors, and then also is levering an audience that they've got as well around this. So we don't have to create all of this audience to support that because they're bringing that audience with them. And then there's this funny thing. So um, uh, a few years ago, before my time, Brand created a pseudo charity called the Sea Life Trust, um, which is basically a sort of bit of branding conceit, really. It does 
good work out of fundraising, but it's not, not really a real charity. Um, so it's created by brand, um, and that needed to become a proper charity to do this. So what we decided was, Sea Life Trust will build and run this sanctuary. This is not something that Merlin's going to do, it's not something that Sea Life's going to do, a different person has to do it. And so, and, and PR is our strongest lever. So we know that, especially um, when we haven't got much money to spend. But Sea Life itself doesn't, have a, doesn't really have a role. So Sea Life Trust is building it, whale and dolphin um, conservation are helping. That's Shangfeng Ocean World, where the whales are coming from, which we've never branded to Sea Life because of this issue. And then Merlin Entertainments is the mother company that is actually funding this, providing loads of expertise, et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to get PR for Sea Life, but we haven't got any, but Sea Life hasn't got a role. So the uh, first thing I did was rebranded Sea Life Trust into a way that it really aligned with Sea Life. So really it becomes that there's not really any real difference between Sea Life Trust and Sea Life. So when Sea Life Trust lead all of this stuff in PR terms, Sea Life gets the benefit of it. So we kind of just took that issue away. And then we designed three waves of PR. An announcement, the transport part, which you can see we're about to do, scary times, and then the release into the bay and plus a, a, a level of always on around that, of course. This clicker's not very good. Now, the point I want to make here is that's not all good news. So as soon as the more news you make about this, the more you put it in the press, the more that you're providing a platform you're free of detractors and all of the risks. So the kind of campaigns, PR campaigns, that I was used to dealing with were really all about pushing out the good news. This massively became a, a job of reputational risk management. So the list of possible things people might say and how we're going to respond to them was huge. Um, because as soon as you start asking people what are the possible things that could go wrong or could be said, then the list gets very long. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but we got lots of, um, we got lots of good stuff and very importantly, 98% positive coverage, which was not what the business was quite expecting. Um, we got hardly any radio cover, I guess it's very visual, and we got very low cover in Australia, which is put down to the fact that Australia is not really involved and they're quite sort of um, contained in what they're interested in. And where was the most coverage? Uh, UK was a lot because it's a UK thing, um, and the States actually, we got a lot of cover in the States. What kind of cover did you get in China, if any? Uh, so China is a very different part of the campaign because um, that is, uh, the danger there is that this is about taking the whales away from us um, and it's where, and we've got a very tricky relationship with the Chinese government and the export license there as well. So it was a very different situation. And a bit of negative stuff here is things like this. So um, uh, there's next to the sanctuary, there is a place that sells dolphin meat to, um, sorry, whale meat to uh, tourists. In Iceland. Oh, in Iceland, yeah. And the way that that got reported in the press was as if that was part of the sanctuary. So it's a bit like Merlin Entertainments is building this thing and then you can have whale meat in the cafe. And it's just like, <laughs> it's not true. But the thing is, for, some, for an organisation like Merlin, it's like they think this is devastating. For somebody like me, I say, this is a great platform for us to actually tell people the good news about what we're doing. And you get more eyes on that than you do on the good news story, right? And we got, I'd say, okay media, social media results. Um, got not great volumes, but really good engagement. And it worked like this. So the first bit, the first burst is organic, and then we followed it up with paid. And you can see the relationship between Mentions and engagements in our page was much higher than it was in organic. So that's a good start, but not good enough. So created a partnership with Cargolux. So these guys are delivering, if you like, want to use that word, the whales for free. That's worth hundreds of thousands of pounds as gifting kind to us. So that was money where we could then use in a different way. So that was part of my way of funding the other things I wanted to do. And then that came with as well, this chap and some other chaps. So um, social media stars, they've got their own social media star. They're doing their own PR, etc. So it extends our reach by working with other people effectively. And we're doing a TV documentary. So working with an organization called Plimpsol, 
That has been commissioned by ITV. We hope that that will go a bit more global than just the UK. And then we've got John Bishop as the person who's heading that up, who then becomes also the ambassador for the whole thing. And once you get celebrity involvement, things really start getting going. So that's really good. All of that comes with more risks. So when you do a documentary, we're not, we're not funding this documentary. Remember, I haven't got any money. So I'm handing over to ITV the rights to make a program about us where they can say what they want really so that has some real risks obviously contracting around that to reduce the risks but you know there it is and when you get involved with celebrities that comes with risks as well what if he does something awful tomorrow um, he's seen eating a whale meat sandwich for example that would be bad <laughs> um, and then there's partnerships and here's one really great one so Olympus their big problem of course is phones have replaced cameras they're still trying to sell cameras so their job is to make cameras be much more attractive and they have a, uh, a group of really, really excellent photographers they're working with. They are going to produce a book for us where all of, the, all of the proceeds for that, not just the profit, but the actual whole cost, the whole revenue from it, goes to the Sea Life Trust. Um, and they'll have um, a press night at their gallery in Notting Hill and so on and so forth. And they're doing some other stuff for us as well. And then We've got 20 million people coming through our sites. So this is definitely not least. Whilst I put it last, it's not least. Um, we're doing a CGI projection to get people to love the belugas. So there was some stuff earlier today about how emotion is more important than rationality. This is the emotion bit on site. And then we've got a bunch of stuff which I would call a bit Blue Peter, a bit kind of, you know, very, very basic. Um, but We've got a lot of sites and not very much money. And actually, this is stuff that people do engage with well. So, you know, a fundraising thermometer, a map, um, some sort of basic stuff that people can get involved in. And really importantly within that, it's about how our staff are equipped to talk to people about this project. Like, so if somebody goes up to them and says, hang on a minute, you're doing all this stuff with whales, but you've still got sharks in, in captivity, how come? Then they can answer that sort of question. And it's a big boon for employee engagement. So we really know that our employee engagement scores, when people understand this stuff, shoot up, especially when you're employing so many marine biologists. And that was it. We're just about out of time. But if there's any more questions, then I'm here to answer them. Nothing to do with marketing. What? Why can you keep a shark in care? Ah, yeah, good question. <laughs> so um, cetaceans live in family pods. Um, so if you start splitting those up or putting different pods together, that's really, really bad for them. They're super intelligent compared to other marine life. And there's other things as well, like um, uh, they use sonar. And when you put a creature like that in a tank that's all tiled, their sonar bounces off of those walls and sends them crazy. So there's massive differences between cetaceans and most other marine creatures. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well spotted. They have to go into quarantine on our dry side in our pool before they can go into the ocean. How long is it going to take you to fly them over? Um, it's like overall, it's a. It, it turns into. Um, they leave on one day and they arrive on the next, so it's less than 24 hours, but it includes a stop. Yeah, it includes a stop in Siberia. Of <laughs> all places. That's it. We're out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks.